All right, good afternoon. Here we are. We are joined today with Kung Lee and attorney Rob Macy. We're going to talk about the UFC antitrust lawsuit and the developments that took place yesterday in Las Vegas. Welcome to the show. Thank you Thanks for having us, Chris. Thank you. My name's Chris. Um, I'm with MMA and Censored, and let's just get into it. Let's go. Uh, first question will be for you, Mr. Macy. Uh, we want to know a little bit about your background, please, sir. Yeah, so I, I grew up in a baseball family. My, my brother played baseball growing up through high school. He was drafted. He eventually made the major leagues. So I knew about the Baseball Association, and because I was kind of such a fan of the sport, I also knew the interplay between bargaining, antitrust, and league sports. Um, I played baseball through college. I entered law school at 21, so I was young. I was really young uh, for, for the school that I was at. I still wanted to be an athlete. Um, I couldn't play team sports because I, I was at an Ivy League school. Um, I was eligibility banned. They had a jujitsu club in the wrestling room. So I, I, one of my buddies said, hey, you should come out because we were watching UFCs uh, at, at, our, at my house. He's like, yeah, I go to this club. You should come out. So I started going to the jujitsu club. We would rust, you know, jujitsu with the Cornell wrestling guys. Um, that was sort of my first eye-opening. Oh wow, wrestlers are no joke. <laughs> it, it, um, just from an uh, athletic and strength standpoint, I mean, they were dominant even if they didn't know what they were doing, uh, jujitsu-wise. Um, after law school, I moved out to Los Angeles. I ended up at Beverly Hills Jiu-Jitsu Club for a time. Uh, at that time, you'd see Oleg Taktorov, you'd see Big Bob Sapp, um, a number of other UFC veterans. Marco Huas would be in there at the gym. So I, I started meeting some of those guys. And then about six months later, Eddie Bravo beats Hoyler Gracie in a grappling tournament, which was a mind-blowing upset. Um, Bravo opens up 10th planet soon after that I ended up in his gym. One of our teammates at UFC 44 gets asked to fight Josh Thompson on the undercard. So basically our gym drove out. And at that time, I think this was like 2002 or three at, at that time, uh, the lower bowl would be full from the prelims on up and the upper bowl would be empty. And I, I think it was because the tickets were still pretty much affordable. I mean, the, the gyms could afford uh, eight rows up on the side middle cage. Those tickets would be $75 to $100. We, we would drive out. We would you know stay in hotels together. So we weren't, we weren't priced out at that time. So we started going to the events. Well, after that event, Gerald loses at the end of the first round to Joss Thompson. He comes out, you know, about 10 minutes later into the stands and he's asking to borrow money to get home to Oregon. And I, I was like, wow, what is going on? So, I, you know, I'm looking around, uh, I'm starting to do calculations right away. I'm like, there's 15,000 people here. The average ticket price is $100. The concession lines are 100 deep. And then I started following Dave Meltzer to get an idea as to how many pay-per-views these things sold because I had no idea. We get, we get back to the gym. I start asking questions of the fighters. I'm like, I don't understand. How's Gerald borrowing money to get home? Well, he's got to pay for his medicals. He's got to pay for his brain scan. He flies out a corner. He might need to get an extra hotel room. Um, and he's only making two and two, 2,000 to fight, 2,000 to win at that time. So I was like, oh my, these guys were literally paying out of pocket to fight in the UFC until the mid 2000s. It wasn't just the early days. It was, you know, quite a bit into the career. So about 2005, I start the Mixed Martial Arts Fighters Association. At that time, I was doing uh, little packets. So you can see the logo here. So I had folders made up and I'd put, you know, ex explanatory pamphlets inside. I'd put cards and I'd FedEx them to gyms across the country. And then on the side, I was writing articles. So I wrote a series of articles on the Ali Act. I wrote one on the merchandising rights agreement and in these articles, you know, the first paragraph, I would kind of imply that I was talking to all these fighters at all of these gyms. I, I wasn't, I, I had a very small 
circle of contacts basically in Southern California. I'd be LA, Orange County, and a couple in Vegas because they would come in for their grappling tournaments. But I didn't want others to know that because I wanted to get into the gyms. So I started this FedEx campaign. Three years go by, nothing. I didn't get a single call. Nobody would answer their phone. Nobody knew who I was until Elite XC. Elite XC came up. That was a fairly prominent promotion um, that was doing fairly big shows. Um, but it became apparent at some point they were out of money and they weren't going to put on any more events. But what they weren't doing is they weren't releasing fighters. So fighters were basically put on the shelf and they were just sitting there waiting. I, I finally get called by some of these agents and they say, hey, we, we have these guys stuck in the lead XC. How do we get them out? And I explain to them, I say, well, we can file for a declaratory action, meaning release them from these contracts because they're not being performed. Um, they, the promoters in breach, let them out. <clears throat> but if you do that individually, it's going to be around $500 each fighter just in filing fees and service fees. And they're like, oh, wow. Well, I've had 18 guys. I have 20 guys. I have 12 guys. So this, they're doing the math and it's kind of prohibitive to them. That's even before, you know, if you pay any attorney, which I, I was doing a volunteer. <clears throat> uh, so I, sa I said to them, or we can file suit as the Mixed Martial Arts Fighters Association on behalf of a list of members that we keep private. And they're like, we can do that. I said, yeah, we can do that. And I proved it up to them. We drafted a complaint. We forwarded it to Elite XC. We, we'd never actually filed the complaint. We just forwarded it to them with a cover letter. And the cover letter said, if this is not resolved within a week, we will file this lawsuit. <clears throat> within a week, those contracts were sold to Scott Coker and Strikeforce. The guys were released. They were now getting fights. They were happy. Um, from that point on, my, my circle sort of expanded sort of drastically. So now I could start calling some of the more prominent gyms, the more prominent agents. They would answer the phone. They would show me what I needed to see. And it kind of sped me up educationally, um, which sort of led into the very beginning of this antitrust suit. So in 2011, I get asked to do a presentation as a keynote speaker at the West Virginia Law School. And at that point, I, I was a little bit of a nervous speaker because I had never spoken in front of an auditorium of 600 people before. Um, but I was like, well, if I'm ever going to get good at it, I just have to do it. So I, I, I flew out there. I did it. I struggled a little bit um, with the exception of the, my presentation was very good. So the presentation gets leaked. Some of the reporters publish it. Some other fighters see it. At the end of that West Virginia presentation, one of the professors asks, you know, I, I had no idea fighters were going through this or the, you know, the pay treatment was that bad. Why hasn't there been an antitrust suit? And my response, I, I still remember this was because I don't have a plaintiff yet. I, you know, I can't be the plaintiff. I can't file it on behalf of my own. I need somebody to step up uh, and do the suit with me. <clears throat> About a year later, um, March, 2012, I get, I get a call, it goes into my voicemail that I kind of blow off. And I, I blew it off because I had done a lot of favors for years uh, for writers, for fighters, for managers. And I was just kind of, I was favored out. I was like, I don't want to do, I don't want to do any favors right now. So I just kind of blew it off. I get another voicemail, same guy sits in there for a couple of days. And I'm like, oh man. So I listened to it. Guy's sort of mumbling, but I can hear the phone number. I was like, oh, okay, I'll call it. So I call the number, play phone tag. I finally get this guy on the phone. And he's he's like, yeah, so if I fly into Arizona, uh, do you think we can meet up? Like, yeah, sure, yeah, I'll meet up. I'm thinking he wants to go to dinner or something. I'm like, but, but who am I talking to? He's like, Garzun. I'm like, who? It's Garzun. He kind of mumbles. So he finally says it slow enough. And I'm like, Carlos? He's like, yeah, from Toronto? Yeah, 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 that's me. And I'm like, oh, wow. Yeah, I should be talking to you. Because I actually had a poster of Carlos Newton and Matt Hughes's fight autographed. <laughs> it was hanging on the wall. <laughs> so I was, I, was, I was like, wow, this is kind of surreal to me that he's the one that calls. But I was like, sure, yeah, I'll meet up with you. Where'd you get my contact information? He says, Pat Militich. I was like, oh, well. Wow. So he flies in and I'm thinking, we're going to go out to dinner. No, he stayed a mile from my house 
at uh, a hotel my wife worked at. He wanted me to pick him up 8.30 in the morning, drive him into my law office, put him in a conference room with my Westlaw password, <clears throat> and then take him home at dinner time all week. He did that for a week. So like day four, I take him to a baseball game. I'm like, Carlos, what are, what are we doing here, man? Because I, I, I sort of had an idea as to what, what he was doing. And he, he just laughs. He says, Macy, I know you figured this out. You're going to file an antitrust suit. <laughs> I, was, I just kind of laughed. I said, Carlos, I'm a real estate lawyer. I don't care. You're filing it. And we did. We started the next day. It took us almost two years from that date to get it to the point where we had recruited the national firms to come in and filing. So that, that was kind of the process. It was, you know, a long time coming. I'm just thrilled. Guys like Kung, uh, who joined on at the very beginning of the lawsuit, stuck with us, believed in us. Uh, we're seeing the results now. It's change is coming. Congratulations to you both. Thank, Thank you. Thank Kung, uh, how do you feel about what happened yesterday? Uh, you know, um, I, I've been in in a few of these, and I, I definitely got to say this was uh, one of the the moments when we left that room. We were so excited, and um, you know, um, as you can see, everyone was a little bit jumping around on my on my video, and especially the 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 lead attorney was like he was all amped, and and um, you know, it's my first time seeing like really close to, and then my wife was with me also she kept on saying oh look his hands are shaking which is the, their lawyer and then he, he was doing this and i was like okay yeah this 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 is like uh this is the working out the way we we're hoping it to work but then at the end uh, you know rob and everyone told me i'm all that was good right and they're like you don't understand how good this went so rob can take over because you know i mean it was like it was your moment, Rob, you know, because you've been at this so long, you should let them know and let everyone now know how how excited we were, because this is seven years in the making. And it, for a while there, was it was dead in the water. And then I told Rob, hey, Rob, watch this. I'm going to do this. I'm pulling out a page out of the Old Testament. I'm going to pray straight for seven days. Seven days, three months later, boom. Rob was like, I don't know what's happening. All the lawyers, we don't know. I remember Rob telling me that. We don't, we don't know. And I was like, what do you mean? Like something we don't know. And, and I said, okay, I'm gonna pray again. One prayer, boom, next day. I, I and I even called Rob. See, I told you. So prayer. Amen. Amen. Yeah. So, so as Kung said, this was sort of seven years in the making and I'm just going to jump back to 2012, 2013, 2014. Um, people in the industry will know what I'm talking about, but for fans, when, when we were, meeting with fighters and fighters were being introduced to me about this lawsuit almost uniformly the the reaction that we would get from either media fighters or managers managers in particular would be this is impossible you guys have no chance of winning you will be buried by the ufc you'll be crushed in legal fees you'll be swamped in documents and they will delay this forever it will never happen that was literally the consensus and even continuing after we filed after we filed the consensus was we won't survive dismissal and then after we won't survive dismissal you won't survive summary judgment each step of the way they've been projecting our loss i have said since the very beginning since this this has been obvious to me for since at least 2011 since the strike force acquisition i knew this was coming i just didn't know exactly when i was very confident we were going to win the entire time the judge on August 9th issued the class certification order. And as part of that order, he has to give, he has to at least somewhat dip into the merits of the case in order to make that class certification decision. So he's already sort of going into what he sees as the dispositive reasons why the fighter's motion carries. In his opinion, he writes those reasons. And he says stuff like, the UFC uses brutal coercive tactics in order to keep fighters locked up in contracts for the duration of their athletic careers. He says that. He says they bought up and shut down promotions, not because it added to their business, but to deprive fighters of opportunities to compete in the marketplace. That's in there. <clears throat> he says they are by far the dominant market power in terms of market share, and they, in our case, is truly a monopsony. 
and the, the difference is just for the audience is a, a monopoly is one supplier of a product that it sells to the public. A monopsony is the inverse. It's one buyer of an input of the, an end product. And in this case, this is why combat sports and sports in general are truly unique. The fighter is not just an input. The fighter is literally the product. People are not tuning in to see three letters dancing on a floor mat, right? <laughs> They're tuning in to see Lee fight Frank Sh Shamrock. That's what sells an event. <clears throat> the judge agreed with that. He certifies the class. And what that means is instead of the, when we initially filed in 2014, we filed Kung Lee, Nate, Fitch, uh, Brandon Vera, Javi Vasquez, and Kyle Kingsbury. And we asked the judge, we said, we want to file this as a class action, not just for these six, but for all 1,215 fighters that are members of this class. That's what happened our August 9th. So our suit is no longer six asking. It's now 1,215 of which Kung is a named plaintiff rep. That's a huge difference. Our case just became much more real, much larger. Uh, on the heels of that, and this is what happened yesterday. This was also great. We had requested a status conference um, from the judge because we wanted the fighters to be able to speak to the judge directly. And this was before class cert. A class cert had been held up for due to COVID and also due to there was a Ninth Circuit opinion dealing with class certification that was up on appeal. So our judge waited. <clears throat> the judge post the class certification order grants that status conference and he set it for yesterday. At that status conference, within about four minutes of that conference opening, the judge says, just so it's clear, uh, both sides here, plaintiffs and defendants, I'm going to be scheduling, fast tracking and scheduling the Lee case for trial, which will begin in March or April of 2024. And I will work from that endpoint and make do all the other scheduling working backwards from that date. Wow. That, that's enormous. Uh, we, we were concerned our trial date might be 2025, could be 26. Uh, dis discovery might have to be reopened. The judge said, no, we're, we're going to go damages, Lee. Um, then we're going to go damages in the Johnson case. And I'll explain that if you, if you have questions about that. And then after those two cases are completed, we will have a hearing on injunctive relief. And the injunctive relief portion is that's where we're asking the judge to enter in to enter a court order prohibiting Zufa from doing certain business practices that led to their monopoly in the first place. We're act asking for changes to their business practices so this doesn't happen again. <clears throat> He's going to allow us to do that staggered so we don't have to wait for all three to complete all at once. Uh, just as an example, the Johnson case. We had to file the Johnson case because the Lee case ended June 30th, 2017. So we had a time period gap. Our fix for that was in June of 2021, we filed virtually the same lawsuit with Cajun Johnson and CB Dalloway. By statute, we can look back four years. So we're into June 30th, 2017. We had no time period gap and it goes forward to today. Well, yesterday, the judge says, I'm going to lift the stay in Johnson and open up discovery in that case immediately. So we get the next set of documents. We get the next set of financials. We can start serving third party subpoenas, uh, build up the Johnson case. Um, it, it was a very, very good day for fighters. Um, we're confident we're going to start seeing the changes we said were coming all along. And I believe they are also um, unsealing some documents, sir. Yes, uh, good point. So that that was the other one of the other sort of agenda items yesterday was there was some question as to whether the entire record in the Lee case would be unsealed. And by unsealed, that means not redacted or not hidden behind you know a blank page. It now everything on that page becomes public. The judge said due to the passage of time and the it sort of public import and nature of this case in particular, I'm going to unseal everything except for if it has, you know, Kung Lee's phone number or somebody's phone number or somebody's email address or social security number. You can redact that. Uh, medical information, you can redact that, but everything else is going to be public. That 
as also I think, uh, some media members are going to be very sort of curious uh, and interested in, in, in that next batch. batch right. If they, if you um, go to um, say, make a settlement or make come to a, a agreement before it goes to trial, is there a possibility that that does not get unsealed and the public does not see them documents? I don't believe so because this, this is controlled by the judge. This is not us. You know, what was one of the purposes of courts is it serves sort of the public interest. Um, in, in particular, there's a very famous quote uh, from a judge, sunlight is the best of disinfectants. You don't get sunlight if everything's under seal, right? Or everything's behind closed doors. And the fact that we've been using judicial resources for going on 10 years now uh, in this court, I think it's going to be important for the judge. No, I want this stuff public. Right, that's amazing. Um, I've got a couple questions here. Um, could you go over what does the class certification mean one more time for the audience? Yes, it, it means when we filed the suit back in 2014, there was six named plaintiffs. Are there, yeah, there was six. No, we started with three. I'm sorry, we started with three named plaintiffs. It was Kong, Nate Quarry, and John Fitch. And then over the course of the next two months, we filed a series of additional cases that were eventually consolidated into one, I believe around 2016. <clears throat> At that consolidation, the plaintiffs were Kung, uh, Nate Corey, John Fitch, Brandon Vera, Javi Vasquez, and Kyle Kingsbury. So just six. Those six were asking at that time, yet while only six are named, because uh, I mean, in all honesty, they had the guts to do it. <clears throat> while only six are named, we want to file on behalf of all the other fighters that are similarly situated to us that fought in bouts during this time period. The, the judge on August 9th said, yes, I am certifying your class. You've satisfied all the class certification requirements. Those six now represent 1,215. Wow. Okay. What do you get to say, Kong? You're snickering. I'm just, you don't understand sitting through this and, you know, also going through, uh, you know, uh, you know, I, I had to sit there while they, they brought, you know, uh, you know, asked me a bunch of questions, you know, when discovery happened, right, Rob? And yes. it was, you know, it was uh, emotional for me because, you know, um, you know, they, uh, just to hear all the dirty stuff from, from my teammates at AKA, going through all this when I wasn't part of UFC, then me being part of it, then just remembering all the times that, you know, after, you know, I lost to Michael Bisping with everything going on. Um, it just, uh, it, you know, it just brings up a lot of uh, uh, memories that, you know, we, we had to, you know, check our gut and then uh, roll up our sleeves and uh, keep our chin down and, uh, you know, take a uh, roll with the punches. And then, uh, you know, while everyone was, too busy saying you'll never have a chance, Kung. What are you doing? You know, you're gonna ruin your name. I said I don't care about my name. You know, it's all about the fighters. It's about us. You know, we're the one who's bleeding, and we're the one who's taking the punches to the face and knees to the face. So for all those, you know, people who are like keyboard warriors, you know, that's just like going off, but they don't understand. If they did a little research, like you know, on this case, then they would understand more, and they would have a little bit more, you know truth to speak but you know it just feels good because now you know i just remember with you know um you know like with uh you know like dana calling me and saying just just do this just do that and i just now it's just smiling because i i see how how uh how things are rolling and how how it comes back you know it's like it's 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 just a great feeling that we're able to represent the 1215 fighters we have a good group of guys and to bring in the, the the thing that moved this forward was God and Jesus and faith in the project and um, I mean faith in this case and and uh, we pushed forward and uh, we believed and it happened and it just happened really fast and like it, I, I remember just uh, you know like six or seven weeks ago I was talking to Rob what's going on what's gonna happen and Rob says oh, we don't know we don't know and then I said well we gotta pray more and one prayer did, uh, one prayer after the seven days it just it's just a great feeling. I'm, I'm just so honored to be part of this case and uh, representing 1,200 fighters and all the other fighters soon to come, you know, and, and uh, you know, 
how amazing would this be if we had an open market where, uh, you know, other promoters can say, I want to have, see who, who's the best. I'm going to put up the money. And then now the fighters are going to get a chance to really make money because now there's going to be bids for, for the top fighters for the best fights, you know? And uh, that's, that's where the true money's at. Not, not, you know, where, um, you know, um, the UFC makes all the money and, and, and the fighters are living off 15% of just like profit. I mean, it's, if that's, you know, and it's just, I'm, I'm, I'm just, I, I feel, I'm so awesome. I'm so happy to be part of this case. It's just, it was great yesterday. We recently saw um, UFC heavyweight champion Francis Ngannou leave the company and he, he put himself out there and, and tested the market and he was picked up by PFL and he, now he's, he's working for PFL. Um, he is in charge of PFL Africa and he's going to be fighting Tyson Fury this October in Saudi Arabia, uh, making at least, I'm hearing $20 million plus he's doing PFL. Um, and I'm going to go right back to you, um, Mr. Macy. Um, and this is the big question. This is the reason why I wanted to do this story and get involved because this is, I want to leave this, uh, I want to do the same thing you guys are doing. I want to make sure these fighters get taken care of. Because they're the only reason why I'm here, um, Kung, Kung, and, and what you're doing, uh, Mr. Maisie, is incredible. So here's my question. Um, and this is the one everybody wants to know. Um, how does this, what happened yesterday, how does that affect fighters today and the next generation of fighters negotiating contracts? How does that, how does that affect that, Rob? So uh, I'm just going to rip off what you just said, using Francis as, as the example. Francis was able to become a free agent because of the lawsuit Kung filed. And, and that, that's not conjecture. That is, that is fact. Francis had put into his promotional agreement a sunset clause. And, and what, what that did was after a period, I believe his period was five years, regardless of whether he had fights left, regardless of whether he had injury tolling or retirement clauses or champion clauses, it didn't matter. All the tricks that the UFC had done for years with everybody else, Francis had an end date. He gained his career at the end to get to that end date with the title. That was intentional on his part. But the only reason he had that clause was because we filed this antitrust suit and they wanted to start showing our contracts aren't doing what plaintiff says they are. Plaintiffs say they last forever. We can toll them with all these different things. Well, look at Francis's contract. Well, ultimately, what happened was Francis used that sunset clause to get out. Uh, Paulo Costa used that sunset clause to at least negotiate a new deal with the UFC. And what happened after that? They took away the sunset clause. Now it no longer exists. In fact, not only did they take that away, they inserted class action waivers and uh, mandatory individual arbitration provisions in the new promotional agreements going forward. What's telling about that is and if this was a competitive marketplace, fighters would just basically say and walk out. They wouldn't sign these deals. The fact that they can just uniformly dictate these blatantly one-sided, ridiculous clauses and fighters sign them anyway, anyway is patently, in, in our view, makes it patently obvious they are still exercising dominant monopsonist control because otherwise there's no way fighters would agree to this crap. And that's how it'll help the fighters going forward because you will file um, to eliminate those and uh, eliminate those actions and their behaviors. Correct. That that's the injunctive relief portion. So th there's there's two sort of two aspects that are giving us leverage with this antitrust suit. The first is obviously they're facing a monetary uh, damage award. Uh, those can get quite large, and if they don't change, we'll just keep suing. We'll sue repeatedly, you know, in four years, we'll file the next Johnson case or we'll file, we'll file the next case on behalf of four more fighters. We'll just keep doing it until they change. And then in addition to the damage portion, we're actually going to ask the judge, judge, enter an order. They must stop doing X, Y, and Z. We don't know exactly what that is yet, but, you know, as an example, we may ask the court to say the UFC can't have contracts that last more than one year. I think agency that would lead to wow yeah that would be huge wow um that that's the kind of an example as to what the injunctive relief portion does um 
that's through the lawsuit. Now on, on, on the side and sort of ancillary to the lawsuit, we're also working on the Ali Expansion Act, which is, that's why we're in DC lobbying Congress and Senate to uh, expand that act to cover fighters. That act essentially works because it requires disclosure to the fighters of the revenues their events generate. So the next time they negotiate with that promoter, they know here's what dollars my events bring in. It works for that reason. And it works because it separates rank and title from the promoter. That's really the UFC's mechanism of control. They dictate title ascension. Whereas in a sport, titles independent of promoter, I have different paths to get to the top. So if you're treating me like an asshole, I can leave you and go somewhere else. I can fire you. Think about this. Mike Tyson, and I just tweeted this out. Mike Tyson about 15, 20 years ago gave an interview and he said, boxers hire promoters. It's not the other way around. Fighters are not employees of the promoter. The promoter serves the fighter. So does the manager. So does the athletic commission. Uh, if anything else is happening, sport has been corrupted. And that's why you see the UFC. That's how you get that result. They did that by controlling rank and title. Um, that's the other change that we are actively working on. We hope to be in Congress soon. Uh, and we, we encourage fighters watching this, get involved, do what Rasad did, call, call Kung, get in touch. Um, you know, st stop sitting on the sidelines watching, participate. Get on in there. All right. Um, we touched on this, but I wanted to ask you, um, what other cases are you working on? What other pro products do you have going on, Mr. Macy? So there's, there's a, a couple of antitrust suits. Uh, th that I'm actively working on. My, my background still kind of cracks people up. I was a real estate lawyer that just happened to know antitrust because I knew uh, I, I knew antitrust sport. I, I wouldn't say I knew it through price fixing or anything else. I knew how it worked in sport. Um, but yeah, my, my background was real estate. I did some general commercial business litigation, uh, some corporate formation, real estate work. Um, and then this M M MMA stuff was largely just a hobby until it sort of took over my career <laughs> in 2012, thanks to Carlos. That's awesome. Well, one, one thing I want to throw in, is I sort of want to correct the record on this. And it, it's sort of bothered me for quite a while that this has been missed so often by, by media. Uh, when we filed this suit, the headlines were almost uniformly former UFC fighters filed suit against the UFC. And what bugged me about that is not many people know this. Kung Lee actually got a six figure fight offer in March of 2015, which is after we filed suit. He was still under contract. He was still active, still getting fight offers. He, he turned that down because he didn't want it to sort of, the optics of it would look weird if Kung was suing the UFC on behalf of all these fighters and was still taking fights. He didn't, he didn't like the way that looked. So he turned it down. His opponent in that fight was supposed to be CB Dalloway. Both ended up as plaintiffs. Wow. We're fighting the real fight now. Yes, you are. <laughs> um, I've got a, another question for you, um, Rob. What yeah. would you say to the 1,215 fighters about what to expect next? So what's going to happen next in terms of timing is tomorrow, uh, that's August 23rd, the UFC, if they haven't done it today, is going to file a notice of appeal with the Ninth Circuit. Uh, very briefly listing reasons. It's not going to be a full brief. It's going to be very, very summary asking the Ninth Circuit to take up our class certification order on appeal. We will file a reply to that on September 5th. And then the Ninth Circuit has 90 days to decide whether they're going to hear that appeal or not. They take less than 20% of these appeals on average. So the likelihood is the, the Ninth Circuit is going to deny this appeal just sum up summarily without even having a briefing or hearing or anything. They're just going to write denied. <laughs> If they do that, the judge has already told us what's happening next. We're, we're going straight to summary judgment and trial in March or April. If that appeal is taken up, that appeal process, let's say the Ninth Circuit in December says we're going we're going to take this appeal, they will set a briefing schedule, you know, likely April, May of 2024. 
and probably a hearing towards the end of the year in 2024. That process takes usually takes about a year to get from uh, the filing of the appeal to briefing to hearing a year, a year and a couple months, which would put us, you know, potentially trial date in spring of 2025. We are optimistic that appeal is going to get denied, uh, which would put us on on pace for trial in 24. The, the other thing I want fighters, you know, anyone watching to do, if they are watching, go to ufcclassaction.com. There's a space for you to enter your email address. Please do that. And uh, if you would, add contact information, you know, your address, your phone number, so, so we can be in touch. At some point, we're going to want to send communications about the case to our class members and we're going to want to um, send notices. If, if you can make our lives easier by providing us that information instead of us having to, you know, scour the earth to find it, <laughs> that, that would be much appreciated. And the, the other thing about that site is if you have any questions or you're curious, you want to see any of the, the major filings and documents, those are all posted. You can download the PDFs. They're right on there. You can download the class certification order. It's up. Uh, under the update section, section. and then the, the the final thing about that site, and, and this is sort of important, is following class cert, fighters in the class are going to get solicitations, and the solicitations are going to be from other attorneys that say stuff like, in order to share their share of the fighter recovery in the Zufa lawsuit, you need to retain your own counsel. That is not true. All all five firms listed on that site. If you go to the tab called le legal team. All five of those firms already now represent everyone in that class. And those are the same firms that have spent millions of dollars, tens of thousands of hours, and have been working on this case for 10 years. Um, you don't need to do anything. And anyone asking you to do otherwise is essentially asking you to opt out of the class, which will weaken the class as a whole. Well, that's great information. We'll make sure we get the website out there. Was it UFCClassAction.com? www.ufcclassaction.com. Um, I had another question really here. What would you tell um, current and future UFC fighters at this point? Um, we've had a couple um, notable UFC fighters, including a new champion, Sean O'Malley, um, have negative to things to say about managing and managers in UFC and MMA. Um, this, this to me gives the fighter a lot more knowledge and a lot more leverage where they wouldn't really need, um, a, say a manager as much as they would before. What's your thought on that? Uh, good, good question. Um, I, I'm going to start by saying over the past 12 months. So from, from now dating back 12 months, over a dozen, dozen boxers made eight figure paydays. Only two MMA fighters are going to make eight-figure eight paydays. But they had to be boxers to make that, not MMA fighters. Right. Nate Diaz and Francis Ngannou. Doesn't that suggest to you there's something wrong with MMA? Because the MMA events are generating as much revenue as those boxing events. But yet, all of the pay is going to the, to the promoter. And, and what happened was, again, when the promoter controls rank and title they are the ones that dictate ascension. So back in 2011, the USC finalized their domination. They bought Strikeforce. <clears throat> Following that Strikeforce purchase, and there, there's an email, this is cited in the judge's order. It's from Joe Silva to Dana White and Lorenzo. And the, the, the email was dated, I wanna say late February, 2011. So it was about four weeks before the Strikeforce purchase, but they knew the Strikeforce purchase was coming. The email was ranked fighters one through 15 uh, by the, the predominant MMA sites. Um, it might have even fight matrix of each of the major weight classes. Here are the one through 15 fighters. And then the subject line, he just writes, we own MMA. That's it. Doesn't say anything else. <clears throat> they own MMA because following strike forces purchase, they have, virtually every one through 15 in every weight category. So now instead of promoters having to compete for fighters that compete for titles, fighters have to compete against other fighters to get into the UFC. That's the only place to make it to the top. 
the UFC by controlling Ascension dictates the contract you have to sign. And, and here's an example. This happened to Aljamain Sterling a couple of years ago where Dana White was basically playing three fighters off of each other. Who's ready for a title shot? Oh, well, Aljo's not quite ready for a title shot. And, and that, that is really code for Aljo hasn't signed his nine fight extension yet. Until he signed his extension, he's not ready. No other sport works like this. Just this one. Just this one. Uh, any other sport, that this is illegal, including boxing. Uh, one example we use is imagine Roger Goodell in the NFL when the Cincinnati Bengals win the AFC championship game, deciding, nah, I don't, I don't really like the Bengals. They're too small. I'm going to put in the New England Patriots instead. And he just swaps them out because the Bengals aren't quite ready yet. There would be congressional hearings. The, the restraint and ridiculous of that, of that would be apparent to everybody. That's what happens in the MMA all the time. And it's, it's why we say MMA is literally not conducted as sport. And by that, and, and this is not intuitive most, you have to explain it to them. Any other sport, if I win, I move up. I win, I move up. I win, I move up. It doesn't matter if I'm boring. It doesn't matter if you like my style. If I'm a wrestler and you hate wrestling, beat me. If I win, I move up. Except this one. This one, UFC has to tell you, we're going to let you move up. And that's how they reverse the play, pay split. They're not actually competing anymore. Fighters are competing against each other to move up. Very good point. And, and, and this is extremely important information for all the upcoming fighters, um, not just in MMA, but all combat sports and, and really all sports. Um, Kung, you have a son, uh, I believe Anthony, 18, turning pro. Yeah. Um, Congratulations. He wants to fight. So this is one of the reasons why I'm part of this. And, um, you, know, uh, it, you know, again, a lot, all the fighters, you're going to be getting hit up by the lawyers. Just know that we already got you. So it's just uh, it's just a crazy world right now. Absolutely. Um, Rob, you have something? Yeah, no. Uh, sort of the overarching point is it, 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 it not have to go into boxing to get paydays. And right. Sean O'Malley, you know, just wins the biggest, biggest fight of his career, becomes a superstar and is already talking about boxing. Javante. Yeah, right. No, 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 Sean, I want you talking about AJ McKee in a super fight that's promoted the highest bidder in Dallas Cowboy Stadium. That's what I want you talking about. And Hello. The way that happens is we got to separate title from promoter. Because what's going on with when the title's controlled by promotion is is it's not sport and that's how they get to dictate what you have to sign. Otherwise, everybody has to compete against each other. That's how, how, have they, how have they let this go on for so long, Rob? What's the reason? Yeah, it's, a, it's a very good question. Um, regulatory capture, that is my best answer. This should have never been allowed. In fact, if you read the Congressional Act, uh, just do, do I have a couple minutes? Yeah, oh, you have, you have, you have as long as you need. Okay, so uh, we I'll, have I'll, no time frame. We're recording. I'll, I'll jump back to uh, the 1990s for a second. There, there was a promoter called Don King, 80s and 90s. He was notorious for using options on his boxers, particularly the heavyweight division. And by options, if he was promoting the WBC heavyweight champion and you know some other up-and-coming star wanted to fight his champion, King would say, you're not getting that fight unless you sign options to where I get to promote your next six fights if you win. And he did that for years, so much so that people were convinced the Ali Act, which eventually passed in 2000, was literally to address Don King, his option practices. They wanted to do away with that. So the Ali Act comes in in 2000. Well, at that time, Lorenzo Fertitta was a commissioner on the Nevada State Athletic Commission who testified, Mark Ratner, who was also a commissioner, testified at the Ali Act con congressional hearings in favor of the act. As soon as that act passes, 
it says boxer. It just said boxer. It doesn't say combat sports athlete. It doesn't say mixed martial art, just boxer. So what happens? Lorenzo Fertitta miraculously leaves the Nevada State Athletic Commission and six months later buys the UFC. Instead of running tournaments, which they used to do, now the UFC put up title, their own title that was defended show to show. Why was that allowed? Good question. So the, the, oh, the other point that I that I skipped over is if you read the congressional histories, uh, the congressional history and in, in the Congress and also the Senate, they actually have paragraphs. If you allow rank and title to be controlled by the promoter, it leads to monopoly. This is the equivalent of Wimbledon telling a tennis player, if you want to compete for Wimbledon's title, you can't compete for any other. The, it would be apparently obvious to everyone that is a restraint of trade. It's right in the congressional histories. They wrote this. You're telling me Lorenzo didn't know that? Hmm. They knew. I, I, In my opinion, they knew. They knew right from the jump. Uh, go to, to the, I believe it was 2003. This is the only time in my memory that the UFC ever sort of did an, a, a co-promotion. Um, it was with Chuck Liddell. They sent Chuck Liddell to Pride to compete in the Pride Grand in Japan. And at that time, especially in the gyms, Pride was a very, very popular show. In fact, many people thought Pride had the best fighters in the world. <clears throat> Dana was convinced if I send Chuck, Chuck's going to win that tournament. We will devalue Pride and we'll take them over sooner. Well, fortunately for fighters at that time, Randy Couture was UFC champ because I'm convinced if Randy goes to that Grand Prix, Grand Prix, he would have won stylistically. Not that they're not all great fighters. I just think stylistically, Randy would have won that tournament and it would have hastened Pride's demise. It would have went, went away faster. What, what ended up happening at that time, though, was Quentin dominated Chuck in the semifinal. So now... UFC has a problem. Chuck later becomes UFC light heavyweight champ again. And Rampage is out there having dominated Chuck and everybody saw it. So what did the UFC have to do? And in fact, Dana admits this. I had to get Quentin's contract from the WFA. And he did. Because he's got to bring him into the UFC to get him beat. So the general public doesn't think anyone outside of the UFC is elite. It just delayed the process a little bit. 2007, they end up buying Pride. Mm -hmm. They bought WEC, I believe, in 2006. IFL went away. They bought WFA's assets, culminating in Strike Force in 2011, who was also doing huge regional shows, uh, particularly in the Bay Area. Mm -hmm. Buy them up. It leads to Joe Silva's e email, we own MMA. They knew what they were doing, uh, why this was allowed, why it's still allowed. I honestly think the athletic commissions are exposing themselves to liability because they are sanctioning as sport world title fights to the general public. And in fact, UFC's own executive officers are going to Congress and saying, our belts aren't real, they're fake, they're ceremonial. It's right in their promotional agreement. Our belts are ceremonial, they're not real. Wow. Fine print. <laughs> Holy crap. There's a lot of awesome information here. I mean, there is. Uh, thanks, let's, Rob. Uh, yeah, let's. Uh, whew, amazing, amazing job you guys done. And uh, a lot of this stuff is not out because they've done a good job of suppressing this. But with the MMA uncensored, yeah. Oh yeah, everyone's gonna know. We're Woo! gonna get it out. Uh, Bob, is there anything you want to put out there? To close this out, and I'd like to say one more time, man, I could tell you worked hard. Congratulations. You're passionate. You're like me. You're like that MMA fan old school. You probably went to the Blockbuster and got your VHS tapes and been watching it since UFC 1. Uh, Hoist Gracie, uh, Chemo, you know, Hoist Gracie, you know, you, you, you kind of got me, got my blood pumping. Yeah. <laughs> Just to date myself a little bit, those Blockbuster trips were like anticipation because you never knew. Am I going to get five? I just watched four. You didn't know if it was going to be. Right. Oh, yeah. Tape days. So you, you might watch them out of order even, uh, which I did. Um, but yeah, I did, definitely. I, I was definitely a huge fan of the sport until 
uh, you know, I started seeing behind the curtain and I just, I, I knew I sort of had uh, an unusual sort of knowledge base and skill set. Uh, and, and more importantly, I had the will to do it. Uh, you know, very few people have the will to see something through over 20 years. Mm -hmm. They have a much shorter fuse. Uh, I, I've been very upfront with these guys sort of all along, you know, they'll ask me how long, how long are you in this until we fix it? <laughs> you know, that's the answer until it's fixed. Um, how long is that going to take? I, I don't know. I know what the fix is though. I do know what we need to do to fix this. To, to fighters to close out. I encourage you go to that website again, ufcclassaction.com. If you have any questions, just put in, you know, a little note on the, on the form saying, Hey, I want to talk to one of the attorneys. One of us will call you or, you know, reach out, reach out to the fighters, you know, call Kung, uh, call, call Nate, call Fitch. You guys know a lot of these guys reach out to them. They'll speak to you. And, uh, you know, if, if, they need to refer you. They'll, they'll re refer you to where you need to get. I ignore anything you get from law firms that are not one of the five listed on that, that site. They're they're not doing that for a good reason. That's a reminder. Make sure any law firms reach out to you. These are for the fighters. Just ignore it. If you have any questions, go to Kung Lee. You can you could email us. We could refer you to Kung or whoever is in charge. I've got a really, really good question here. One, one last good one, one last zinger. Um, if this goes to trial, um, Rob, if this goes to trial, will people like Dana White, some of the big name fighters like the Conor McGregor's and, and, and the big name fighters, will they appear in court? Almost assuredly. Uh, okay. You know, what, what big name fighters, I can't tell you, but in terms of the executives, yeah, absolutely. They're going to be testifying. They've already been deposed. Uh, they don't have the ability to refuse to come to Nevada, which is where our trial will be because they are company execs. So, so those I can guarantee will be there. Um, other witnesses, if they're outside of a hundred. Uh oh, he got cut off. <laughs> yeah. He'll, he come back on. Yeah. He happens. He'll just pop back on. This is yeah. great, huh? Wow. See all that info. That was, I'm telling you, he's like, he's a encyclopedia. Oh, he sure is. <laughs> oh, yeah. You want to text him and see if he wants to finish it off? Um, yeah. If not, finish it off. Um, and we could, you know, get some more. Uh, he answered all our questions. Let's let him finish this real quick. Yeah. It's a good one. That's what the people want to know, Kong. So basically what um, attorney Rob said is if this goes to trial and there's no settlement, um, people like Dana White, um, the Fertitas, um, executives with the UFC will be called in to, to be on the stand and give their testimony. And if they don't tell the truth, um, you know, we know what can happen there. Um, so that's huge. I, I see and I think maybe you there could be a settlement because this this could be a lot of information that the UFC, Zufa, WME, IMG, the new owners don't want to get out there, sir. Yeah, but, um, you know, we'll see. I, I, I'm not focused on the UFC, what they're planning to do. I just already know that, you know, with God before us, nothing can stand against us, not even the UFC. So God first and everything else will follow because it's been that way for, for me. So um, I, I'm, I'm going to stick to my 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 gut and, and um, i'm gonna go i'm all in with god and and as you can see if you see this whole thing it was seven years seven days of prayer on the seventh floor god had his prints all over it and says don't worry and yesterday was supposed to be like the craziest day for the storm to hit vegas sunshine it was sunshine and trust me after after we went home Rob, Rob, they're like, oh, we're going to go have some drinks. I said, I'll have dinner. I'll catch up with you guys later. Me, my wife and I went back, and we just prayed, and we thanked the Lord, and it's uh, it's, been, it's been amazing. So, Rob, we lost you. Yeah, hey, guys, sorry. My, my battery died. I, I, I think I was just at the point of if other witnesses are outside of 100 miles, we can't force them to appear in Nevada. Um, some will voluntarily come if we ask them to. Um, but in terms of the UFC executives, yes, they'll, they'll be testifying. They'll be in court. Rob, Rob. Okay. 
let, 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 let's just say if you were on their legal team, what would you do at this point? No, I can't answer that. Oh. <laughs> Okay, can you answer this one, Rob? I got a good uh, one for you. Uh, actually, I, I can't answer that. I can't answer that. There is no way in hell, because I have to sleep at night, that I would ever be on that side. <laughs> <laughs> what, um, now, when this, okay, so if I, I'm off with the figures, please correct me. Um, if this goes to trial, the payout to the fighters can be up to $4 billion. Um, yeah. Possibly. Yeah. So our, our economist does uh, ver various regression models and uses various benchmarks to uh, come up with estimates of how much our class was damaged. The, the estimate ranges are between 811 million and 1.6 billion, just depending upon, you know, what assumptions are used, what regression is used um, and, and what benchmarks are used. If we go to trial, uh, just just as an example, let's say that the jury awards us uh, a damage award of nine hundred million dollars. By statute, if we go through the verdict, whatever that damage award amount is is tripled. So that nine hundred million would become two point seven billion. If we get a billion, it's three billion. If we get one point five billion, it's four point five billion. That that's where that tripled amount is coming from. It's statutory, and it's 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 to encourage private parties just i think this is important for people to know so i'll throw it in um these these cases as, as you've seen are incredibly complex they last 10 years uh the attorneys are out of pocket nine ten million dollars already and just in terms of costs that's to pay economists that's to fund travel to pay uh investigators uh, court reporters, transcripts, all that stuff. That's not attorney time. That's expenses that we're fronting. Yes. And then there's tens of thousands of attorney hours on this case already uh, on our side. <laughs> They're incredibly expensive, incredibly time consuming, and incredibly risky to bring. So uh, by statute, that's sort of a policy. Congress wrote in an incentive to encourage private attorney generals to bring these cases to start with. And, and that was sort of the carrot that was given to the plaintiff's bar to pursue these cases was the, the threat of triple damages. Now, in effect, what that usually accomplishes is it's such uh, a hammer on the back end that it usually brings the defendant to the negotiating table to see if they can get a settlement in advance of trial. That's ultimately the effect of that troubling because, you know, if we get a billion, $1.5 billion award, that's not crippling to uh, WME, but $4.5 billion, that, that's going to hurt. That's going to hurt a lot. Uh, and I think they know that. Absolutely. Um, I believe the numbers for quarter two, 2023, uh, revenues for um, WME. Uh, Endeavor were 342 million. Um, that was their revenue quarter two, 2023. Right. Yeah. So I mean, you're, you're just extrapolating that. You're talking 1.4 billion. Yeah. I mean, Love. no. You you'd be talking if we got a 4.5 billion dollar reward, three years of revenues. That that hurts. Oof. Big time. You're you're, you're having my assistance. I do it. I got my assistant here too. And uh, um, I, I think that was the last question I had. Um, shoot. I mean, what, what would you, to close it out, Rob, what would you, um, is this one of the things that you kind of would like to be remembered for uh, in, in your life, um, this, this achievement? Oh, of course. I mean, I hope so. You know, it's something you've been working on for 20 years and you're finally seeing you know, sort of uh, the end of the horizon, um, it, it will be a huge accomplishment. And it's, I, I'm so far into it, I couldn't stop now, even if I wanted to. And, and believe me, there have been times where <laughs> I want to take a break. Um, but there's just so few people that are willing to go through what I did to have this done. Uh, which is why, you know, I wouldn't even say it was all that hard to put myself in this position. I was the one doing it. <laughs> I wasn't competing against anybody else. I was the one. <laughs> you were competing against yourself. Right. Literally. 
you know, Absolutely. do I have the endurance to, to stick it through? And yes. you did. And congratulations, Rob. <laughs> congratulations, Kung Lee. Um, I appreciate you guys' time here. And it's uh, www.ufcclassaction.org. Com. Dot com. Dot com. Make sure you go there and sign up, fighters. If you have any questions, reach out to Kung Lee. Um, and you can you can also inquire on that website. You can answer, uh, send an email, or you can message us. Um, once again, thank you guys for your time today, and have a great day. Hey, thank you very All much right. for having me. Thank you both. We'll take All care. Right. Bye. Dang, that was awesome. Awesome. That was.